1948, psychologist Abraham Maslow identified what is known as the hierarchy of human need. The pyramid has five tiered layers, go ahead, working from bottom to top, and his premise was that physiological needs need to be met first, your food, clothing, shelter, and unless those needs were met, you didn't really have the ability to kind of step up to meet kind of the next need of, of safety. You were so busy trying to take care of that that safety then would fall away. Then the next, the idea of being loved and belonging, the one above that, esteem or self-confidence, and the one at top, self-actualization, the idea of having purpose. And so it's still widely held today that these are the five-tiered basic human needs um, and that you begin at the bottom and they have to be met uh, before you would ever get to a place of living with purpose. The celebration of Advent predates Maslow's theory by about 15 centuries. We celebrate Advent, and we would see an additional set of necessities for life. Hope, love, joy, peace, light. But these aren't tiered. They come as a set. They come as a set in Christ. I think if you did a person on the street interview and you asked um, the polling question of, are these five basic needs of human existence, love, joy, or hope, peace, light, that you would get this, I think, this overwhelming sense of, yes, the, those, are, those are definitely most important human needs. And yet, you'd probably get as many people as you interviewed, you'd probably get as many different um, explanations of where you go to attain those. I heard the results of a LifeWay research poll this week that made this statement. The Christmas holiday should focus more on Jesus, agree or disagree. And 65% of the respondents of the survey agreed. And so when I heard that, I was kind of like, well, okay, I would have hoped for more, you know, but I'll take 65%. I mean, we work with 65%. And then the next line from the commentator said, but last year it was 79%. 79 a drop of 15% in one year. But it makes sense to me. It makes sense that there's so much doom and gloom because there's so little hope, so little people holding on to hope, so much division because there's not enough love, there's so much depression because we're not holding on to joy, so much unrest is the reason why there's no peace and so much darkness that there's not enough light. It's hard to believe that those rest, all of those rest in one person, the Son of God, and yet it's true. You might say, Pastor, isn't that just pie-in-the-sky thinking? Wouldn't an intellectually honest person have to just stick their head in the sand to believe that we can live in all of these hope, love, joy, peace, and light? But the reality of the incarnation is that we don't, we don't live in these, we live with these. We don't live in them. A lot of things surround us, the doom and gloom, the, the darkness, a lot of things are surround around us, but yet we can live with them. The real, that's the real key of understanding the Advent and understanding Christianity is that we live with Christ who embodies all of these. On our own, we are too limited to manufacture any of them. Life is too fragile to sustain any of them. And too many things stand in opposition to them because they're not, they're not moods, but they're positions that we can take in Christ. And we really can live with all of them. The first Sunday of Advent, I preached a message on hope that called Nevertheless out of Isaiah chapter 9. And nevertheless is a big, powerful word. Nevertheless takes all of what precedes it and says that it doesn't have the power to eliminate or stop what's going to come now and what's going to proceed from it. Nevertheless. That our hope isn't hitched to our past. Our hope is hitched to Christ. Last week, we lit the love candle, and the kids gave us a program called Straight Out of Bethlehem. This no longer looks like the city of Bethlehem, like it did last week if you were here for the musical. It was an amazing, amazing set. And the, the kids, one particular, the most poignant song of the musical, said that there are no strangers, no outcasts, and no orphans in God. Teaching us about the love of God. We lit the joy candle this week but I'm going to preach on peace. Why? The main reason is I can. <laughs> My joy message is next week. 
And here's the overarching theme for today, is that peace is exclusive, but it's not elusive. Peace is exclusive. We're only going to find the peace that I'm preaching about today in and with Christ. But Christ is not elusive, therefore peace is not elusive. Some people define peace, most people define peace as the absence of conflict or trouble or, or even instability. And in that case, peace is always going to be temporary and it's always going to be conditional. In other words, it's always going to be elusive. But because the Bible describes peace as a person, the person of Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, then it's not elusive. He comes down to us. That's the celebration of Advent. It's a celebration of, of God becoming in the flesh with us. It's not elusive. He comes down. And it's not temporary because he's the same today as he was yesterday. And he's the same today and yesterday as he will be in the future. So, so it's not conditional. There isn't any kind of hitch to it. So the question becomes, how do we live with peace? Here for me, the Bible is a window through which we can observe God's interconnection with imperfect people Navigating a sinful world with a holy purpose with peace. I put it down because that's a lot packed into that one statement. And we are imperfect people. We have limitations, not just physical limitations. We, we have emotional limitations. We, we, have, we have intellectual limitations. We, we have limitations. We're imperfect. And yet God comes into our imperfection, and our limitations, and he lives with us. We live in a sinful world. There are things that oppose our peace, but he comes into this sinful world working with imperfect, limited people because there is a holy purpose. And we can be imperfect, and we can face um, of challenging, limiting circumstances and still carry out that holy purpose in peace, because we carry that peace with Christ. And so taking this Bible as our window, so you, if seeing is believing, it's definitely necessary to see to follow, okay? If seeing is believing, seeing's necessary to follow, and the Bible gives us a window, and to this morning I'm going to use two different couple stories out of what's known as the birth narratives of Christ, Matthew chapter 1 and 2, Luke chapter 1. And we're going to see the window of God working with imperfect people in a sinful world with a holy purpose with peace. One couple you would say life has probably already passed them by. They had, they had already seen their better days. This may be how we have, well, how we put it. The other couple, young, bright-eyed, engaged, probably haven't even started adulting very much yet. Thank, thank, I, I, thank you. There were several of you just didn't want to admit it. And in these two couples, we see what Christ does when he comes. The first is one of my favorite stories in all scripture, which is why we're going to read a lot of it today out of the book of Luke. And this is a story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. It begins in verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. These were priestly Tribes. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly, and then but, but they were childless. Because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they both were very old. Once when Zachariah's division was on duty and he was serving as the priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of the incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Now let me bring some historical significance, some light to this passage. You can't do this on, on your phone digitally, but you can, you can do it with, with the Bible um, physically. So the last words from the prophet Malachi read this way. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. 
These were the last words heard out loud through a prophet from God until what we read, what we're going to read right there. That in what would encompass in just my Bible, one page represents 400 years of silence from God. Now Israel still carries on in the temple. They still carry on with the sacrifices. They still carry on with the rituals. They still carry on, yet, yet they haven't. And I would say, what faith? They would still carry on having not heard one word from God through a prophet. And God breaks his silence through an angel to Zechariah with the prophecy, fulfillment of what he had said 400 years ago. We know 400 years. God doesn't know time. Not, not in the sense that he can't wrap his brain around time. He exists outside of time. He has invented time. So, so, the, so this gap of 400 years feels something to us. It doesn't necessarily feel something to God. And he breaks in and he gives these words. Um, here is, uh, here's verse 11. The angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Spirit even before he is born. And get this. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of whom? Elijah. To turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people ready for the Lord. I believe it had to be ironic and not wasted on Zechariah that he had that his division of priesthood, it, it had never came to the place where his division was up on a day where it was time to offer incense prayers to God in the holy place. And that this was a lifetime kind of probably something that, that every priest would have hoped would have happened to them. And in this time in his life, much older, he gets chosen to go behind the veil to offer incense. So in other words, he was, he was offering prayers on behalf of a nation before God. And yet we find in here that he had had some prayers and those prayers had not been answered. I think he had to go into this experience kind of up and down a little bit. That, that even maybe, maybe, maybe some lacking of confidence that how am I supposed to be bringing the prayers of a nation to God, and yet, where did my prayer go? And the angel of the Lord, after 400 years of silence, angel of the Lord appears to him in the holy place where the presence of God was supposed to dwell, and he was surprised. It's kind of a sad part of the story, actually, to me, that he was in the place in the presence of God, and he was surprised by the presence of God. And if I can just take a moment, we gather this morning in the house of God, in the sanctuary, where his presence dwells. But how many times do we enter into his house and his sanctuary with zero anticipation and zero expectation of him showing up in a way that's undeniable? Zachariah comes in. He's got all the emotion churning. I don't believe he's just doing something by rote and routine. And then the angel appears with, don't be afraid. The peace of God coming immediately with, don't be afraid. But listen, what's interesting is he doesn't go. Um, well, where he starts is, your prayer has been heard. If you, can, if you can still, if you can grab the context, I do believe Zachariah is wondering, why is it that I'm offering incense and prayers to the Lord and my prayer hasn't been answered? And the first way the angel interacts with him is your prayer has been heard. Listen to me. Most of the time, we are mainly interested in God answering our prayer. 
But when we're only concerned about God answering our prayer, really what we've done is we've changed places with God. Because, because what we're doing is, we're re- what we're really saying is an answer to my prayer looks like this. So many times we say he didn't answer my prayers because it didn't look like this. But we should be most concerned about, does God hear our prayer? Not will God answer my prayer. Will, does God hear my prayer? And in this moment, God speaks directly, very personally to Zechariah to bring peace to him by saying, your prayer has been heard. I wonder if Zechariah had abandoned that prayer in Elizabeth. I wonder if they'd gotten to a certain time, they just said, I'm not going to pray that, pray, pray that prayer anymore. I keep praying that prayer. I don't get an answer to that prayer. I'm done praying that prayer because I'm tired of being disappointed with that prayer. Or I wonder if Zechariah brought that prayer and resurrected it back up when he was in the Holy of Holies. Either way, what we know is whether he abandoned the prayer and Elizabeth abandoned the prayer, God had never abandoned them nor that prayer. I don't know where you are today. But even as I was writing this out this week, I said, stop here. Be clear. The peace of God is knowing that he hears your prayer. Wow. So we move on. Zachariah's response could be anticipated. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along with years. I've always loved how that was stated. It is marriage 101, gentlemen. We're old. Our wife is moving on in, in years. The angel said to him, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which, which will come true at their appointed time. Now, it's, it's kind of like when you get a text or an email, and you, and you never really know what people are saying, because there's no way to read tone, right? There's no way to, no way to understand um, uh, tone or circumstance in reading that, because it sounds like Zachariah has a legitimate question. Look, I am, I am old. My wife has been barren. She is old. How is this going to happen? It seems like a legitimate question. However, it must have been said with some air of dismissiveness or sarcasm, Something that would elicit the response where the angel said, okay, boop, boop, boop. I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God himself. And when God speaks, it comes from his mouth and then out my mouth. This is something you should have believed. And in fact, just to kind of add a little something to this so that you'll know that this is from me, you're going to be silent until the child is born. Wow. Wow. It's, it's kind of a, but kind of a soft velvety, you know. It wasn't like, well, because you didn't believe that, I'm out. And see, listen, I think some of you feel that way. That somewhere along the line in your life, God spoke something, said something, encouraged you to do something, and you were like, ah. I can't see it. I, I'm seeing in the two-dimensional, I'm seeing the circumstances I'm seeing, and, and it, it, I, don't, I don't see what you're saying. I, I, don't, I don't see the possibility of connection. And you thought that you've missed it. My experience has been when my heart's after God, I can't miss it. Now, may, may, maybe there was a window there That was missed, maybe. But it isn't shut, painted shut for the rest of my life. God will bring, and he's bringing this in a short amount of time. It was about a a nine-month time that Zachariah would have been quiet. And then Zachariah's going to be quiet. So we pick up his story. Um, 
Well, let me, let me say this. I, I have a slide here. When God declares and directs, expect them to be miraculous and meticulous. When God speaks, he's going to speak of things we could not have known or manufactured on our own. And when he gives direction, it's going to be of a nature we could not have anticipated. That's called a miracle. It's called a miracle. When, when, when God speaks, he has the power to bring about that which he speaks. And when we put that in the capacity of what we can ascertain or obtain our own, we've just taken it out of the realm of a miracle. Why is it when God speaks to us, we go, oh, I don't, you know, how is that going to happen? How's it? Well, because it's going to be a miracle. Because it's always going to need to be outside of the context of our ability if it's going to bring any kind of attention and glory to him. And when people are drawn to him, they're drawn to hope, peace, love, joy, light. When they're drawn to us, there's only going to be versions of those. And when he gives us direction, it's going to be meticulous. In the sense, what I mean by meticulous, sometimes it would be turn-by-turn -turn instructions. But it's going to be specific. He's going to get to a time of specificity. <laughs> you know, I should never try to say a word I don't write out. And when it takes us directions that we would not have chosen, doesn't that make sense now in the light of what I'm talking about? Sometimes... We, 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 you know, we don't get directions. We, we, we go off on our own and we should be pausing for his. And other times in my life, he's giving me specific directions and I'm saying, look, I know how to get to point A and you're taking me to point F. How is this ever going to get around to point A? But when God gives directions, they're going to be meticulous. Here's the rest of the story in verse 21. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he couldn't speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple for he kept making signs to them but remained unable to speak. I would have loved to have video of that. What, what could have that possibly looked like where you've entered a temple and God has brought an angel and spoken a word to you this miraculous and you come out and you can't even, you can't. What could he have looked like when his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. And she said, the Lord has done this for me. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among his people. God does things this way so it's clearly him and not anyone else. Now, in this part of, of the story, is inserted in Luke. We insert the birth narrative through Mary's eyes, but you got to go to the end of the chapter to get the rest of Zachariah and Elizabeth's story. Verse 57 begins it. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going, home, going to name him after his father, Zachariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he's to be called John. So, so there's communication between Elizabeth and Zechariah all throughout this pregnancy. She has heard now all of the story as he has written it out. They've already gone through all the explanations of why not choosing the family names. And she's on board. No, 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 no. His, his name's going to be John. They said, there's no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about these things. Everyone who had heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was on him. Now, I want you to hang with me. I want to read the rest the end of that chapter because it, 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 it states as prophecy that Zechariah is prophesying, but it comes out as a song. I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. 
He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through the holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. To show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to his father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to able, enable us to serve him with fear in holiness and in righteousness before him all our days. Prophesying. He's reaffirming the promise that had already been given, that was now present. And his son was the forerunner, the person that would announce the next. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of what? Peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. And we have the birth of John the Baptist. The fulfillment of the prophecy, prophecy given in Malachi, where the angel steps in, steps right into Zechariah's world, right into Elizabeth's world, and into ours as well. And he speaks something specific and personal that brings peace. And then with the birth of John, this ball starts really rolling that we're all going to be able to live with peace. Now, we're going to pick up Mary's story because when we start with Mary's story, what you now start to see is overlap in how God works with his people because you're going to see how he does something very similar with Mary that he did with Zechariah, and we're going to end with very similarities with, with, um, with Joseph. Now, Mary's story is picked up in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth to a town of Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word of God will ever fall, your translation might read, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Now here I want to give you some handles that pieces together both these stories. First, the idea that peace originates with a proclamation. Don't be afraid. And it's followed with a promise. Life is coming. Don't be afraid. Proclamation begins the peace process. Don't be afraid. Why? Because where there was darkness, there's going to be light. Where there was emptiness, there's going to be fullness. Where there wasn't any peace, there's coming Christ with us. It begins with a proclamation of don't be afraid. Some of you today desperately, near, ne desperately need to hear the Spirit of the Lord saying to you, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Life is coming. Which leads to the second is that the peace that's promised is self-powered. It's self-powered. To Zechariah, it was, yeah, you, 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 you in your natural sense are not going to have a child. Your wife has been barren. You, you both are too old. But this promise I'm giving you isn't for you to figure out and manipulate and maneuver and control. Man, sometimes we get something from God and we just want to strangle and control the thing to death. 
This is not God's promise to you and me has never been powered by you and me. Self-powered. Mary, I'm a virgin. How, how is this going to happen? Now, the question arises, Zechariah asks a similar question, and he gets smacked down with laryngitis. Mary asks the question, and she gets a tender response, which tells you the difference in how they asked the question. Zechariah received the promise from God. He's going, yeah, right. Sure, now. Now you want us to have a child. Sure. Mary is, wow. Really? Well, I mean, how's that going to happen? It's, it's a completely different posture. It's, I believe you. Let me in on the secret. The other is, not possible. Now, what I love is, the angel didn't move on from Zachariah and Elizabeth. You get me? Because you, you, you're no one talking to me. You get me? Now, is it, uh, you're gonna, you're, now for whatever reason, now you're going to be silent for nine months. But, I have, but the baby didn't stop growing for nine months. They move on to another couple in that nine months. But Mary, Mary's like, oh, yeah. Ha, yeah, I'll, yeah, come on. Now, now give me a little insight of how this is going to happen. Let me read you Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The language is similar. Where, where the Spirit of the Lord hovers, He brings something out of nothing. Because He's the one who brings the power, not us. Mary... Sweetie, man, let me, let, me, let me tell you how this is going to happen. You know, sit down. She probably was already seated, right? Or flat on her back. But let me go ahead and tell you how this happened. And here's how you know the difference on how she wanted to hear the explanation out of Zechariah. Because she says, may it be to me as you have said. You say nothing's impossible with you. Let it be to me as you said. It's an amazing difference. Listen, the peace promise is activated in reception. We receive the word, and it's activated by faith. It's not quagmired with noise, confusion, littered with, well, I don't see it happening, littered with, are you going to have to prove it to me? You with me? It's received, and it's activated by faith. Happened that way with Zechariah. Happens that way with Mary. And let's end with Joseph's story. Joseph's story is found in Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 25, which we'll read, but it carries on in chapter 2. Matthew 1, 18, 25 says, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. Following a pattern. Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had com commanded him. He took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. If you've heard the story before, it's easy to run past it. What was Joseph feeling? Joseph doesn't get the birth announcement from an angel. Joseph gets the circumstance lowdown from Mary. 
Mary comes to Joseph and says, I'm pregnant. And then she goes off into this elaborate story. It's obvious that Joseph isn't on board, but he loves her dearly. He loves her dearly and he doesn't want to see anything negative happen to Mary, but yet he is feeling, he has to be feeling betrayed, discouraged, shattered. And he's carrying the weight of that, but still buoyed by the love of Mary that I've got to do this. I've got to divorce her. But man, I love her. But I can't deal with this shame. I can't deal with this betrayal. I, I can't move past this. Do you, you understand? This is what he's got to be saying. I can't move past this. And when he has thought it all he could think, when he has worked every scenario and angle he could work, he comes to that conclusion. You can imagine possibly that with somewhat of the peace of knowing of what he knew he had to do, he falls asleep. And it's in that dream the angel comes. How the angel addresses Joseph is amazingly significant. He says, Joseph, son of David. David was not Joseph's dad. You would have to go back generations. But Joseph was in the kingly line of David. And what the angels communicating to Joseph is, you think that you're random. You think that this circumstance is random. You think this is the first time I've laid eyes on you. Not true. You are Joseph, son of David. You, you, you were created for this time and in this place. Joseph, son of David. What kind of peace does that speak to someone that feels completely filleted and laid open? To Zechariah, the angel says, I've heard your prayer. Zechariah completely, probably an emotional wreck walking through his duties of priest of offering prayers to a nation and he's not even con con convinced that his prayers had been heard. Zechariah, your prayers have been heard. Mary, you are highly favored among women. The Lord's proclamation to us <laughs> is always going to bring peace. Because he, he, he meets us right where we are with all the emotions that are tied up in all of that. And he cuts through all of the stuff and he goes right to that to identify, if nothing else, to identify, I know who you are. This is not a surprise. You're not a surprise. Son of David. Joseph, son of David. And then he throws in, don't be afraid. This one is a pretty significant not be afraid. Let me tell you why. Zechariah has one encounter with an angel. One. Okay? His wife Elizabeth has zero encounters with an angel. Zero. Mary has one encounter with an angel. Joseph has... When you read Matthew 1 and Matthew 2, there are four dreams that Joseph has. Four. One is pre-birth. Three is post-birth. And all three post-birth, it was to, the dream was an angel coming with direction to protect the baby Jesus. And in all circumstances, now in this circumstance, okay, in this circumstance, um, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord told him to do. And the other three, it says he woke up and he got up. If we're going to activate peace, when God speaks something that is miraculous, that has, does not have the ability to be self-powered, and he gives direction, 
We have to activate that with, how do, you, how do you come to Christ in the first place? Salvation is the reception of a gift. We can't earn it. We couldn't power it. We have to receive it. It was given in full love for us and we receive it. How do you move forward in peace with God? You have to receive it and you have to walk it out. You receive it in faith and you activate it with your feet. And all three on all three occasions, it says he woke up and he got up. He woke up and he got up. Here's kind of a recap. God's peace, God's peace is the promise of Jesus. It's always been that way. It always will be that way. We, don't, we can't live in peace if we're not going to live with peace. Living in peace is going to always be short it's never going to be consistent. It's always going to be dependent on someone else or something else. But living with peace is living in relationship, in tandem with Christ. That was the promise. I will send my son. That was the promise. The birth is the fulfillment of that promise. God's peace is the promise of Jesus. God's peace is always going to be self-empowered, self-powered his power. So when we're tied up, having heard a word from the Lord of how we're going to make this happen, I can save you a lot of anxiety if we will not try to make that happen. I'm convinced sometimes we don't get any further instruction from God because he knows we can't handle it. Because then we're just going to go to figure out how we manipulate it to something else or try to speed up or manufacture the process there. And then the peace is activated by faith and it's, or it's received in faith and it's activated with footsteps. If the team would come, come back up. I want to end with back to this idea that peace is exclusive in Jesus but that it's not elusive. I want to prove that to you. First, peace isn't elusive because God came to us. We didn't come to him first. Here's John 1.14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. I love that the, 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 there's a message version that says he became flesh and moved in the neighborhood. And there's another version that says that he pitched his tent among us. Okay, that is a direct connection to the tabernacle, that he tabernacled. He tabernacled with us. What was the tabernacle? The tabernacle was the presence of God. It was to represent the presence of God. And then now the, the tabernacle's days were done. That's why Jesus said, in three days, I will destroy this temple and I'll raise it back up. Because now he was going to be with us. He comes to us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Second, peace isn't elusive because he stays with us. John 14, 26 and 27 says, But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And what? Don't be afraid. The words of Christ, not just the words of an angel. It's not elusive because he comes here. It's not elusive because we're not alone. He stays with us and peace isn't elusive because he's coming back for us. That's what Advent points to. Advent, Advent leverages an historical event for what will be an historical future. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who has no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who've fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we 
we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. How does he end it? Therefore, encourage one another with these words. It's not elusive because he comes to us. It's not elusive because he stays with us. And it's not elusive because he will be with us and we will be with him forever. We now see through a glass darkly, but we will see him face to face. To have no peace now is to not have any kind of connection to a future promise. It's, to have, it's not to have a connection to a present reality. It's not to have a connection to a past historical truth, the birth of a Savior. Think about that survey question. Should we think more of, we should think more about Jesus during the Christmas season, agree or disagree? To disagree is to rip the heart out of Christmas. It, 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 it is to just take away all of the power. The season doesn't hold a power. Christ has a power. Christmas is a worldwide, it's a worldwide advent that so many times people miss. There's really only two reasons not to live with peace. One is you've yet to discover that Jesus is peace and hope and love and joy and life. You keep depending on something else or someone else to fulfill those. And I think looking around the room, I think we've all lived enough life to already discover that that is not how it works. So there's got to be an alternative. And the alternative is Jesus. And the way we engage the promise of Jesus is we receive what's been done for us. We're Mary. We're be unto me as you've said. And we walk it out with him. Listen, we are an imperfect people living in a sinful world with a holy purpose. And we're to live it in peace. Zachariah and Elizabeth fulfilled a holy purpose. Mary and Joseph fulfilled a holy purpose. And guess what? You and I have a holy purpose. And the holy purpose still comes with our insecurities. It still comes with our um, limitations. It still comes with our imperfections. And he designed it that way so that we people would see the miracle of Christ through us. Maybe you haven't received that miracle of Christ, but you can today. You can give yourself to him today. And maybe you've been caught up. The other spectrum is that you, you still try to live in peace. You try, still try to convince yourself to be peaceful. And that's never been God's intent. His intent was never for us to try to talk ourselves into some kind of peaceful mood. To somehow list out everything going and try to counteract that with anything other than him live with peace. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that today as well. If, if peace has to be activated in faith, received in faith and activated with our feet, that's what I want to do today. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to pray. But if you find yourself in the room without peace, whether that you've never engaged Christ or you just find yourself in a position where the idea of living in peace had trumped living with peace, and today you want to leave with peace, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing that Zachariah did, the same thing Elizabeth did, the same thing Mary did, the same thing Joseph did. Get up, he woke up, and got up. Woke up and got up. And he believed the word of the Lord. I believe with all my heart today, God has spoken to you in a very personal way that one individual could never have the ability to do. And 
And that is a proclamation from the Holy Spirit. And it's his promise that life is coming. You'll stand with me for prayer. Father, we're in this room and we I recognize, Lord, that we are standing on holy ground because your presence makes things holy. Lord, I'm holy because of your presence, not because of my actions. You have set me apart, Lord. You have set this place apart. And you have spoken to hearts in here. Lord, I believe you've spoken to people watching online. Lord, I believe that you will speak directly to folks that will watch this even archived. Peace is not elusive. It comes in you, but it is exclusive. There isn't anywhere else to get it. And I pray today, Lord, that each of us would leave with you. Not leave with a mood, but leave with you. As they begin to sing, I invite you to come to the altar to encounter peace. Get around if you feel like that you you need to meet with Christ and meet with peace. I want you to come on right now.
knew Jesus was coming. Couldn't stop it then. Couldn't stop it pre-birth. Couldn't stop it post-birth. Can't stop it him now. Revelation says that before the foundation of the world, the Lamb was slain. peace of God, the peace of God has come, is here, and will come again. My prayer for you this week has been that you would would live with peace, that you would live with peace. I believe the Father has spoken peace into your heart. The question is, will you receive it? Because I, 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 feel, I feel some resistance, spiritual resistance in the room. And I think, I think where I've pegged that is, is some one more not believing it to be so because you've been so disappointed. And you you don't want to get you don't want to get your hopes up again. And you've you've lived you've lived so long in this, in this hurt, in this disappointment, and maybe even disillusionment, I think maybe you don't even know how to make the step again into peace. It's been, it's been so long since you've encountered this kind of personal interaction with God that he would be able to speak to Zachariah's prayers and to, to Mary's heart and to, to Joseph's lineage. And, and you want to believe it, you can't bring yourself to. My heart breaks right now. Would you push past the fear of being disappointed and reach out to the hand of God extended to you in this moment? Lord, and each time your angel came to these three, early on in the interaction, you instructed the angel to tell them not to be afraid, that you knew that they were going to be afraid, not just because of of the presence of an angel, but they were going to be afraid of the interaction with you. They were going to be afraid of what you were pointing to. They were going to be afraid of what you're promising. They were were going to be afraid of what that was going to look like to walk it out. And so you led with, don't be afraid. And Lord, hear my prayer. Lord, speak into those lives that are holding back right now. And let it be like that trumpet sound for them to hear, don't be afraid. How's that for personal? Don't be surprised when you come into a sanctuary, the house of the Lord, to experience the presence of God. He has always wanted to come. He's always been the one that closed the distance. He's always been the one to close the distance. You hold the last key to peace. 
if you'll receive it. If you'll believe it enough to follow it and walk it out. If you're a guest with us today, and my new neighbors are a guest with us today. You didn't think I would remember, but I remember. It's great to have you part of our worship service today. There's two things I want you to leave with today. That you're known and loved by God. That he comprehensively knows you. All the things that you wished other people didn't know and you've worked most of your life to ensure that they don't know, he knows you. And unlike your fear of everyone else, he knows all of that and loves you unconditionally. You are known and loved by God. And that's where we rest in his peace. We'd love to get a chance to meet you right outside these double doors. There's a big C. We'd love to get a chance and give you a gift if you're a guest with us today. Don't forget, next Sunday, we're going to be celebrating communion as part of that service. Um, Not a part of our uh, Christmas Eve service. Because when you hold a candle and hold a cup and you spill wax on the chair, and you spill it, you know, it's just it's not possible. And, and Christmas Eve, there's a lot of guests. And uh, so I want to do this as a family on next Sunday, receive communion together. Now for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his peace shine on you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace. And you're rising up, and you're laying down, and you're going out and coming coming in both now and forevermore. God bless you. Leave with peace.